welcome to ortho tv ibero america to introduce today's topic and speaker i hand over to leonardo gilo thank you very much doctor for me it's a great pleasure to continue this cycle of uh, regenerative medicine uh, application uh, in orthopedics uh, and today we are going to uh, continue this cycle with uh, lower Uh, extremities with the most expert people of many parts of the world. For me, it's a pleasure. I'm an American, uh, I am an Chilean orthopedic surgeon using this technology since 1999. And we also have to, uh, we also will have a surprise with a very interesting um, a doctor of Germany that we will present after the conference as uh, 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 some a special team. We have today four very expert represents of, representatives of this technology. First of all, we are going to present to uh, Dr. Karin Freitag from Spain. He, she is a very active user of this technology in Spain and also the organizer of the future cons congress of our organization that is the Ibero-American Ibero um, Society of this technology. Uh, the questions might be done at the last part of all the conferences. Please use the chat to do the questions because we are not going to accept these questions during the conferences. Please, uh, Dr. Freita, uh, start with your theme that is plantar fasciitis. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gilof. It is a great honor to be in this great group with all of us, with all of you that are great friends. Now I am uh, going to my presentation because we don't have a lot of time. Let me see if I can do it. If I can do my presentation, um, a minute, please, a minute, please. Um, oh. If, <clears throat> can, can you see my presentation now? No, Karen, not yet. No, please you, try you again. Don't see. I, I will try again. Let me try again. <laughs> Let me try again, please. Un momentito, no se vaya. No se vaya. Share screen. Let me try. Oh, no. Share screen, please. Yeah, wait a minute. Venga, un momentito. Es que tengo que compartir esta presentación aquí. Estoy conectada aquí y ahora tengo que presentar. Está, estoy conectada aquí. Sí. Y ahora tengo que presentar, compartir. Compartir. Sorry for the delay. I know that I have only 12 minutes, but I, I will try, I will try. Presentación, adjuntar una copia. ¿Lo pongo aquí? Sí. Sí. Abro, abro aquí. Eh, share, share screen, compartir eh, pantalla, can please. You see, can you see now my presentation? Can you see my not, presentation? Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. Uh, not yet. A ver, If, sorry, if, sorry. I will try again. I will try again. Es que estaba aquí. Compartir. compartir. Presentación de sí, poder. eso ya lo he hecho. Ya lo he hecho. Y entonces, dele aquí, dele aquí. Dele aquí. A ver, esta es la presentación, sí, pero que la tenemos. Could be possible that Dr. Villani can help uh, us. Uh, wait a minute, please. I will try again. No. Hi. Can you just, uh, yeah? Can you just follow step by step instructions? Yes, I will give her step by step. Okay. Karin, so now just me, just tell her to come to a window where we all our videos are seen. Yes, uh, I know. Let me okay. let me salir del video so, porque no estoy aquí. Video, video, video. A ver, a ver. Uh, wait, wait. I will wait. try one minute. 
Let me one minute, I will try again. Give me again the entrance to uh, TV. Aceptar. No, no, no. You have to do this. Oh. Please kindly, can you listen to me? I will tell you step by step instructions. Okay. So, do you see my face? Can you see my video? Yes, I can see your face. Okay. Can you just click on share screen at the bottom? Can you mm -hmm. see a button called share screen? Green color button? Es que estaba antes metida aquí. Espera, what is it called? Daniel, what is it called in Spanish, that button? Yes. Eh, no, I, I know, Compartir. I know. Eh, Compartir Karin, pantalla. Karin, Karin, por, eh, Karin eh, escúchame un segundo. Olvídate de todo. Primer vale. paso. ¿Tenés PowerPoint abierto? ¿Tenés la presentación no abierta? Tengo, lo tengo abierta. Sí, Bien. sí, la tengo. Entonces, si vas con el cursor a la parte inferior de la pantalla, vas a ver un botón verde con una flechita que dice Share Screen o Compartir Pantalla. Con el cursor a la parte inferior de la pantalla en el centro. Dice Share Screen. Espera, Daniel, perdona, es que ahora solo te veo a ti, entonces, perdonadme, ¿eh? No importa, voy a... no importa. Mira, Aunque voy a vea... salir, espera, voy a salir y voy a empezar, espera, es que esto es así. Entonces, voy a empezar aquí, espera, es que quiero salir de ahí porque si no, no puedo, voy a cerrar aquí. Y ¿Les parece que salir, sigamos? Salir. No, espera, ya no, estoy, ya estoy. Ya estoy. Espera, ya estoy, ya estoy. Compartir pantalla. Ahora tengo Ahora, que compartir pantalla. Sí, mi presentación sí, tiene que hablar. estar aquí. Wait a minute, please. Wait a minute. So, Dr. Gilov, can we move Espera. on to the next presentation? Yes. We In can, the meantime, can... she can sort it out. Yes. Yes. When you, yes. That's what we're doing. Excuse okay. everybody. This is a special problem. We are going to continue with the next presentation until Karen can uh, solve this problem. The next presentation, I will Espera. introduce to you. Uh, que salió uh, lo de compartir okay, pantalla, lo del botón eso. Espera, anterior. Espera, que no can we mute her, please, eh, Niraj? Can we mute yes, doctor? Yes, we can do it. Good, great. yes. Go ahead. Yes, well, we are going to continue the presentation. We are ask uh, the excuses to everybody. This is something that we, we can't uh, solve in this moment. The next presentation, I will introduce you a very good friend and a nice doctor that, very, that is very expert in this uh, issue. That is Dr. Uh, Cristina D'Agostino from Hu Humanities University in Milan, pretty yeah. city also. And uh, she will uh, tell us all about the new knowledge of Achilles tendon tendinopathy and shockwaves. She is a very expert in this technique. Please, uh, Christina, tell us yeah. what must we do now with yeah. Achilles tendinopathy. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see everything? Perfect. Perfect. Yes, Perfect. that's fine. I say hello to all my dear friends and colleagues from uh, all over the world. Thank you very much for invitation. It is always a great honor for me and really, really a pleasure uh, also, as uh, today is a Saturday, and uh, all of you that are connected, it's a heavy duty. Thank you very much again. So we are going to talk about a very interesting, a very important topic in uh, uh, musculoskeletal uh, lower limb pathology. All we know that uh, uh, tendinopathy, from a general point of view, is a clinical syndrome. And uh, uh, nowadays, the most accredited hypothesis uh, for the pathogenesis of tendinopathy is a so-called pallid healing response uh, of the tendon. But in very recent years, uh, the uh, focus uh, of attention uh, has been moved from inflammation to degeneration and to the innate immunity. So uh, we can talk uh, uh, also about uh, tendinopathy. Uh, to a so-called uh, immunocentric revolution in the comprehension of the pathogenesis of uh, the tendinopathy. Uh, in the early phases of tendinopathy, very, very early stages, uh, we can talk uh, properly about inflammation, but in the later stages, we have to talk about uh, the degeneration. And if we 
talk about the regenerative medicine strategy, we have to, uh, to talk about uh, innate immunity as innate immunity is the key for all the regenerative processes. So also in tendinopathy, the therapeutic strategy could be manipulated the biochemical pathway to our healing efforts rather than inflammation. The topic in ten Achilles tendinopathy is very important as in 2011, it has been clarified once again that uh, we have uh, five uh, uh, different diseases. The so-called mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy, that is uh, the disease of the central part of the tendon where the vascularity is, is the poorest. Achilles paratendinopathy, insertional Achilles tendinopathy, right uh, close to the calcaneus, retrocalcaneal bursitis close to enthesis, and superficial calcaneal bursitis. This is not uh, only science, it's uh, very important from the practical point of view. And if we uh, uh, have to treat uh, uh, Achilles tendinopathy, we cannot, uh, um, uh, we cannot, uh, we have to remember the Kegel fat pet, a very important adipose structure that is a focus of interest and a great important target for our therapy. The hypothesis of the Kegel fat pad is it is a special proprioceptive organ in monitoring angular insertion of Achilles tendinopathy. It could be the site of pain in the old Achilles pathology and a real target for the therapy. All, all we know that the etiology is, is very complex. We recognize the intrinsic and extrinsic factor. Intrinsic are uh, related to the structure of the body and post-trauma. The extrinsic factor are drug assumption, system disease, biomechanical factors, and sports activity. And we have to know everything uh, of all these topics as our therapy, the success of our therapy is based also on this fact. From the clinical point of view, the imaging is one of another important factor. We know that the first step is very simple, ultrasound, but power Doppler imaging is very important as we know the staging of the disease and the severity of the disease, but X-ray is as important as well. If we have, for example, erosion of the calcaneal synthesis, we have to think to rheumatic disease. This is very important. And MRI is advisable in case of prolonged pain history and severe swelling. For example, we have to be able to recognize, for example, a stress fracture, a retrocalcaneal bursitis, or in very rare cases, uh, some tumors. Or uh, to detect, uh, we, we are not able with the uh, ultrasounds probe uh, some rupture, some partial rupture. But it's uh, 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 as much important as well to do a differential diagnosis for planning uh, a good uh, therapeutical uh, process. First of all, to distinguish a tendinopathy with a rupture and uh, the presence of bursitis, uh, of metabolic disorders, of the rheumatic disorders. As I already told, uh, the differential diagnosis with a stress fracture, some myofascial syndrome, tumors, uh, and disorders of the ankle joint, for example. This is uh, a very important effect. But uh, we know from the literature and uh, our clinical experience uh, that uh, we do not treat uh, a tendon, we treat a patient. So we have to know if our patient with the long history of Achilles tendinopathy has, for example, a metabolic disease, uh, thyroid is one of the most uh, <clears throat> frequent diseases related to Achilles tendinopathy. We have to recognize if our patient has a history of uh, rheumatic disease. Sometimes uh, the tendinopathy is the first clinical science of uh, a rheumatic disease. So we have to be able to recognize. But also to keep in mind that uh, we know, for example, tendinopathy is induced by quinolone and uh, some other metabolic diseases uh, like diabetes and uh, hypercholesteremia. Uh, we do not have only show waste. Show waste is a good uh, uh, therapeutic tool, but uh, we have also to manage uh, sport activity modification, to prescribe uh, uh, custom male uh, orthesis, physical therapy, um, drugs, uh, uh, in injection, and pay attention to the risk of tendon ruptures 
after corticosteroid injection. Uh, from a general point of view, uh, according to the um, international literature, in conservative therapy fields, uh, we have to, uh, to do surgery. But uh, let's go uh, to talk to show ways. Uh, show ways for Achilles tendinopathy are included in the first group of the approved standard indications, so the highest level of uh, clinical evidence. We have to keep in mind very briefly that uh, the action of show waves on tendon is not only palliative, but really curative effect. We know from the literature that tendon have some stem cells. It is uh, well demonstrated in the literature that by show waves, uh, we can induce the tendon healing. We can reduce the destruction of metalloproteinases that are the beginning, the starting of uh, uh, ten tendinopathy and tendon degeneration. We can increase uh, the clonogenic potential of human uh, tenocytes themselves. Uh, and very important, it has been clarified in 2015, the first action of show waves uh, on tendon is uh, to promoting a pro-inflammatory and catabolic processes. It's the first step for regeneration and to uh, recover the turnover, the normal turnover of the tendon. Another key point when you treat Achilles tendinopathy, but patellar, for example, and other tendon, it we have to we can treat the tendon with if we have a tendinopathy of Achilles body, but we can treat also bone marrow edema. And if we have a, a persisting pain, we have to investigate the presence of bone marrow edema. But we can have also retrocalcanea bursitis uh, on more superficial uh, bursitis. So the importance of targeting show waves in Achilles tendinopathy is one of the key points uh, on which we have to stress the attention for our therapy. From the literature in 2015, he has been clarified that uh, focus and radial pressure waves are both efficacy in chronic and in the tendinopathy, all treatments should be done without local anesthesia. Uh, we uh, should use uh, um, show waves uh, if uh, pain is, less, is uh, persisting uh, uh, more than three months uh, or some other effective treatment are not enough. And uh, in 2018, uh, thanks to uh, Professor Daniel Moyer and co-workers, and co-authors, uh, it was uh, uh, it has been clarified that uh, uh, Achilles tendinopathy and patellar tendinopathy has uh, a positive, really uh, high evidence uh, level B according to Bryce. So it is uh, uh, very very justified to apply show waves. Uh, all uh, obviously we have to distinguish uh, focus show wave with uh, some uh, uh, typical protocols. You can use uh, a, a big device with ultrasound probe or some other small devices with uh, a guided ultrasound probe. And uh, the protocols are different according to the source. These are focus your way, but we can apply successfully also radial pressure wave more superficial, but Achilles is a, is a superficial tendon. Uh, uh, only one thing, we have to be able to use the device and pay attention that uh, we cannot treat the bone marrow edema with the radial pressure waves. The interesting thing is that uh, you can couple focus your wave and radial pressure wave, for example, in treating myofascial trigger points and muscle and inducing muscle relaxation in Achilles tendinopathy, but not only in Achilles tendinopathy. Obviously, you cannot apply a biophysical stimulation as a show waves alone. Always you have to prescribe a post uh, show way treatment schedule with the rehabilitation here. You can see representative the classical uh, Alfredson's Alfredson protocol exercise. So you uh, have to say to the patient to take care not to do a strain um, exercise for the following four weeks, uh, exercise in sport activity. 
you have to modify sports activity you, if you have a high level at least and the evaluation of your results is not immediately, is after at least eight to 12 weeks. Only in this way, you can have the best results. Uh, this is our uh, personal experience in our humanitarian research hospital in Milano. And uh, starting to the key points that show waste can be considered not only a simple palliative tool, but properly a curative therapy. That is, you can not uh, counteract inflammation, but modulate inflammation and neuroinflammation. Modulation is of inflammation is at the base of uh, the trophic and regenerative effect with show waste. So we uh, we are able to apply show weight treatment soon after surgery if we have in acute cases. So if we have some surgical complication, for example, persistent pain, edema, loss of function, and fibrosis, as you can as you can remodeling all these uh, uh, bad effects after surgery. So for concluding. We have to remember that show waste and our day can be considered the most effective conservative option for chronic Achilles tendinopathy. We, we had to wait for the effect at least two, three months and never show waste alone in Achilles tendinopathy and from a general point of view in tendinopathy. You can use your waves as a, in a versatile, versatile manner as adjuvant together with other surgical and non-surgical treatment. And the great advantage is the possibility to treat not only tendons, but some other related sources of pain, for example, from muscles, bone, and fascia. And sometimes it can be considered as an alternative therapeutic tool other than surgery. The key for success is, first of all, correct diagnosis. You have to be able to localize the site of, of the disease from a local point of view and from a systemic point of view. You have to follow the so-called good clinical practice rules, so technical equipment, clinical training, practical skills, and certification, and always include showways in a so-called integrated therapeutic program. I wish to, to thank you very, very much for your attention with my best greetings from Milan to all of you. Ciao, ciao, grazie. Thank you very, very much, Cristina. Uh, this was a very, very interesting uh, uh, presentation and we uh, learned a lot with you today. And uh, uh, <laughs> we will continue, please, to everybody that wants to do questions. The questions must be done in the chat, and we are going for to continue the presentations. We are going to uh, uh, ask. We are doing to ask. Yes, uh, to uh, talk about the questions in the last part of the all the presentations. Following again and trying to present again our <laughs> pain that has a, a lot of problems with the, with this. <laughs> 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 I will try again. I will try again. And yes. She is going to talk about uh, plantar fasciitis. Now we have the surprise that we can have Karen now. Please put uh, all the screen, Karen. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. It was too much that I cannot do it. So I that I'm not the best uh, skilled in, in technologies, as you see, but I'm going to speak to you about plantar fasciitis. Uh, it's the most common cause of acquired subcutaneal pain. And as you know, it has a great prevalence in the world's population, about 10%, and the plantar fascia, uh, I standing supports the longitudinal plantar arc like a chain in a truss and dynamics. It stabilizes the plantar arc in the first heel contact. We have different risk factors, intrinsic risk factors in relationship to the anatomic variation of our foot, as planus, cavus, overpronation, also discrepancy in the leg length, and excessive lateral tibial torsion or femoral antipersion. The functional risks are associated with tendon tightness or with weakness of the, of the muscle, crustomnemius, and soleus muscle. 
and of course, like ever, the degenerative risk uh, to relate it to aging and to atrophy of the heel fat. And the extrinsic factors has to do with overuse, mechanical stress, micro tiring, incorrect training, inadequate food weight. The clinical symptoms are very typical. We have a pain with the first steps in the morning or after prolonged sitting. We have a sharp pain with palpate in the medial calcaneal region and discomfort by passive ankle dorsiflexion. And it could be bilateral uh, until 30% of plantar fasciitis would be bilateral. We know that the clinical course for most patients could be the resolution of symptoms within a year, only that you must wait a year and it is a long time. For the diagnosis, we have ultrasound, the thickening of the plantar fascia up to four millimeters, and areas of hypoechogenicity give us the diagnosis. Uh, we should be very careful with the uh, heel spurs because they have no relationship with the symptoms of the patient and we should advise our patient of this matter. And as Cristina D'Agostino told to us, MRI should be always adv advisable in case of refractory pain, prolonged pain, so that we can detect, detect other pathologies. It's very important to establish a differential diagnosis. Uh, this would give us the key of the, of the success of our treatments, but of every treatment that we do, not only for shockwave. So we will, should be a, 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 a thinking about Achilles tendinopathy, stretch factor, a fascia raptor, as I am rheumatology, I see a lot of, of rheumatic and autoimmune diseases in relationship with insertional um, fasciopathies. And if the patient refers these aesthesias, we should think about the nerve, the nerve entrapment, and also tumors and plantar fibromatosis. Uh, you know all about the conservative treatment. I am going, uh, not going to, to lose time about uh, how to, to, to treat a uh, plantar fasciitis, uh, conservative with drugs, instrumental, laser, ultrasound, radiotherapy, physical methods, and complementary strategies, like now that we have PRP, and new emerging techniques, and of course, the surgery. But we have this uh, level of evidence what study for the uh, focal shockwave therapy. It's a randomized controlled multicenter study that done by our friend uh, Gerdes Meyer uh, many years ago, concluding that this gives us a result of success about 50 to 76 percent. And this is a great tool. And if we make a revision of a different meta-analysis, like the meta-analysis from Agile, from the song, for Zoom, for Lou, they are all positive for focal shockwave therapy in plantar fasciitis. And this, this is a, a study, an observational study of 363 feet with chronic fasciitis from Shaw that, that he gives us the, the, the opportunity to optimize our treatments with only one session. As uh, normally we do three sessions, as I want to tell you later. But now uh, the next slides, I will compare the different uh, treatments that we have used in the past and compare to the new tool of shockwave therapy. And as you see, the comparison of PRP and conventional treatment and the ex extracorporeal shockwave therapy concluded that really there are not significant differences between all these treatments. But if we compare with botulin toxin, then shockwave therapy was clearly superior to this treatment.
and we compare to placebo and endoscopy fasciotomy. This is a level two evidence study from Saxena, a very important study also involving Gerdesmeyer and Kolbitzer. They, this is a level of evidence to study. It, it, it uh, comes to the conclusion that both treatments are, of course, uh, good treatments for chronic fasciitis only. If we do endoscopy plantar fasciotomy, the athletes can, cannot remain active in comparison to our shockwave group. And this could be very important. So one of the things that I want to transmit you today is that we should choose very good our patient, the condition of our patient, the possibilities of our patient, the be concerning the work, the economic possibility also. And comparing to corticoid injection with a shockwave group, we have a lower pass and a better 100 point scoring system in comparison to corticoid. But we have a, a, the radial pressure waves. We are not going to call a radial shock waves because uh, we see, we have shown that radial pressure waves has a completely different uh, uh, forms to act in the tissue. So we are speaking now only from radial pressure waves. And radial pressure wave therapy is also a good level of evidence, as this article shows, uh, with improving pain, function, and quality of life. And if we compare radial pressure waves to uh, orthotic treatment, orthotic treatment that we should always uh, suggest to our patient and low-level laser therapy, we the, the studies concluded that radial pressure waves and low laser therapy are both uh, effective treatments and not superior to each other. But if we compare with ultrasound, then um, um, radial pressure wave treatment is more effective than ultrasound. And versus corticoid, we know corticoid injection as we have used years and years before had a short duration of action. And this tool, the radial pressure wave therapy has a longer duration of action. So as I meant before, we should choose very good our patient. And if we compare radial pressure wave with radiofrequency thermal lessening, in this prospective study level two, uh, there is no great differences between both. And we have compared with eight different treatments modality. And we, we, we come to the conclusion that the chocolate therapy is effective in the first six months, but we have not good uh, studies in the long follow-ups. This is a selection of the different studies with a high level of evidence. And if we compare radio to focus, this uh, study published by Laura uh, 21 years ago, uh, he concluded that focus could be superior to radial. And now, in a recent study from Mark, he comes to the same conclusion that a radial a, may be not superior to focus uh, shockwave. And medium energy group had better success for all. This is our proposed recommended protocol for focus shockwave. No local anesthesia should be used. The ultrasound gel is very important because it is our transmission. We should uh, use, we should apply one to three treatments, standard three, 
Uh, Scheuer in this study, he means only one. It could be that it works with an energy flux density from 0.2 to 0.3 millijoules per millimeter square with an interval of one to two weeks. Impulses between 1,500 to 2,500 in a frequency about four hours and with the localization if we have ultrasound or biofeedback. And this is our recommended protocol for radial pressure waves, no local anesthesia as well. Uh, keep care with the coupling gel and the treatments are more treatments from two to five and the recommended energy about five bars in an interval of one week, frequency between six to 10 Hertz and more impulses between 2000 and 3000 impulses and localization as well, uh, biofeedback. We have predictive factors. We know the bone marrow edema could be a good predictor factor for improving the symptoms in bladder fasciitis with the treatment of shockwave therapy. And now the new tool, the elastography evaluation, it shows that higher elasticity could be useful in monitoring the efficacy of the treatment providing uh, quantitative data. We have no complication with shockwave therapy, as Rodney showed us with 39 studies involving 2,493 patients. So we can conclude that shockwave treatment is a safe treatment. And these are our take home messages. No local anesthesia is needed. Uh, PA patient should be informed about the persistence of heel sport. Now, now patients should come to our office to treat plantar fasciitis with shockwave to dissolve this heel sport. And no strenuous activity should be done during our therapy and for four to six weeks after. We should take care of sports modification. Stretching exercises should be done during treatment and after, and a follow up of one month. And as Dr. Gilov told us before, I am the organizer of this great Congress in Madrid. Uh, 24, 25, and 26th of March next year, we will have also our six basic research meeting led by Johannes Holfeld and also a certification course. So you are welcome to this, this great city of Madrid. And I thank you very much for your attention and for your patience with, with me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, very interesting. And um, we, uh, uh, you taught us a lot about the new concepts of this pathology. And uh, also with a very interesting Congress that we, you, are going, you are organizing uh, in Madrid next year. I, I hope everybody will be there because we are going to learn a lot. Uh, con uh, we will continue and I ask you, and ask you before, all the answers of the questions uh, might be done by the chat at the last part of the conferences. Now I'm going to present a, a very, very expert doctor, young but very expert doctor in orthopedic surgery and also in, uh, in uh, regenerative medicine and in shock waves especially. Uh, he will tell us all the news we have about patella tendinopathy and uh, what is happening, Dr. Teran, now in, with this pathology and this technology and the, and the results and what you think about. Please, Dr. Teran, tell us. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us in this webinar and thank you for the invitation to my college and teachers. Our topic uh, today will be patellar tendinopathy. And my name is Paul Teran, and I have uh, no conflict of interest to give this conference. We'll be, we'll belong to ONLAD, and the objective of this lecture is uh, the, to talk about patellar tendinopathy. 
It is important to remember that the physiological uh, range of elastic capacity of the tendon is around a 5%. Over the 5% have a chance of generating damage, microscopic damage, but more than 8% of its elastic capacity, the tendon can break. And that is as the first cause, um, the higher uh, load uh, is, uh, the greater probability of damage. But tendinopathies have stage of production. At the first level, um, it is the injury produced uh, by repetitive activity, previous traumatic injuries, chemical products, or pathologies that um, making cause damage uh, to the tendon. At the next level, there is a failure in the healing process determined by two large groups of intrinsic and extrinsic factors. To reach stage three, where the clinical manifestations that are characterized by pain, weakness, or rupture. Here we can see a normal tendon and uh, what uh, changes its cellular structure in the first stage, the tenocytes become parallel, the uh, cell nucleus become rounded, and the tenocytes lose their fine shapes. All of these chains ca is called fibrocartilaginosus metaplasia. When there are intrinsic factors such as dyslipidemia, genetic factors, hypermobility, overweight, or extrinsic factors such as the use of corticosteroids, statins, uh, previous li ligament injuries, consumption of quinolones, or poor sports technique, we move on to phase two, um, where the tendon healing process fails, existing disorders of the tenocyte proliferation, degeneration of tendon cells, disruption of collagen fibers, um, increase in known co uh, collagenous matrix. Uh, it is now when we reach uh, phase three, uh, where the clinical manifestations appear with failure to bear loads and the appearance of pain, producing mechanical failure, like this example. Canos demonstrated uh, the existence of degenerative change in 97% of Achilles ruptures. But we must uh, not forget that the pain is caused by a complex system of altered neurotransmitters, even at the level of the central nervous system. The patellar tendon tendinopathy is a second most common tendinopathy. It's the, first it's the first cause of pain in the anterior region of the knee in high-performance athletes. Uh, progressive limitation or function uh, is uh, important and appears with a variable pain according to degree of affectation and time of evolution. Difficult recovery with reserved prognosis. Histologically, it's uh, a degenerative process, epoxy, dialine, mucoid, mixoid, fibrinoid, lipoid, calcifying, and with fibrocartilaginosus metaplasia. All, sage, all cells chains, collagen, uh, tenocytes, uh, extracellular matrix are six. Uh, the collagen fibers lose their parallel orientation, decreasing di diameter and density. Type three collagen increase and failure to perform its function. In uh, uh, physical examination, the basset maneuver with the knee extension is positive and the pain may disappear with the knee inflection. It is important to evaluate the state of extensor apparatus and range of mobility with dynamic gestures. Differential diagnosis with similar Sergio Johansson and Sudleister uh, are important in young people, the patellar chondromalacia, patel, prepatellar bursitis, medial uh, synovial plica, uh, meniscopathy, total or partial tear, 
are very important um, in the differential diagnosis. We use the scale of Placina, which is based on the patient's pain when performing physical activities. And also the VISA scale that allow us clinical classification based on symptom severity, functional capacity, and sports performance. As a method of initial diagnosis, ultrasound has shown safety in 12 diagnoses compared with MRI, allowing to see details of the best quality in patellar tendon, like nevoscularization or ruptures, as well as the nevoscularization scale in which grade zero does not show flow, grade one vascular flow visible only near tendon, grade two presence of um, one or two vessels in the patellar tendon, and grade three, the presence of three or more vessels in the patellar tendon. The MRI is uh, used only for chronic case uh, localization with uh, uh, greater precision, identification of concomitant injuries like uh, ligament injuries, but does not serve as a prognosis and there are not immediate chains with any treatment. But we can be done. Not invasive treatment or minimally invasive treatment um, or surgical treatment. Uh, must be necessary. Uh, there are many reviews on possible treatments in tendinopathies, such as uh, biophysical stimulation, like show waves and uh, electromagnetic fields, or uh, laser for laser, uh, bioagent agent cell therapy like stem cells or PRP, scaffold implantation, and surgical approach to the tendon injuries are many possibilities of treatment. But the rehabilitation is the constant of three phase of treatment. The best current therapy, uh, therapeutic alternative is the use of shock waves. Um, and we can see now the form of uh, focus shock waves. There is no major difference in the therapy with radial pressure waves and focal shock waves. The way we apply shock waves is with the patient in a supine position with the knee flexed. In the Professor Leal's review, it recommends the use of shock waves in chronic tendinopathy or when conservative treatments have failed. Use of anesthesia is not recommended. It should be kept at least two weeks at relative rates after shock waves. Working with eccentric exercise shows better results than with uh, shock waves alone. Three to five sessions is necessary, one per week. This is the suggested protocol for shock waves uh, types, uh, radial pressure waves and focus uh, shock waves. This was demonstrated in this meta-analysis by Lyon uh, et al, which concludes uh, this study obtained in moderate evidence that uh, general shock waves significantly increase the um, treatment success rate, pain reduction, functional outcome, um, uh, based on this meta-analysis. Uh, both shock waves therapies are worth considering the treatment of soft tissue disorders particularly patellar tendinopathy. But be careful. We have started to have complications due to poor application or ignorance of uh, with this technology in cases of chronic tendinopathies where it is observed tendon tears and difficult in their resolution. Um, therefore, we recommend reading this article, this review article, which was on an onlad before detailing the complication and poor results with shock waves. We have worked together after the application of shock waves with high volume imaging guide injection, which has been shown to be complementary method to improve the 
function and pathology of chronic patellar tendinopathy. Some example of this technique in these little videos, the objective uh, is to dissect the space between the tendon and Hoffa's fat, uh, eliminating the pathological blood vessels. But uh, you can uh, see uh, the, the technique um, in this example. But there are many several effective alternatives for this pathology, such as open orthoscopy, surgical treatment, um, medication, high intensity laser, and also biological treatments uh, with perpe or stem cells. But the su success is achieved with an accurate knowledge of the pathology, proper use of technique, ultrasound guide, and the most important thing for me is the teamwork. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, we will continue to the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. And everybody of us has learned a lot from these experts that can teach us uh, everything about low, uh, low extremity and uh, shockwaves. Now we should continue with our actual president uh, of OLAT, um, an expert in shoulder and elbow, a great person, and also an expert on, in shockwaves. Please, Dr. Daniel Moya, we need to know everything and you teach us about great trochanter pathology and regenerative medicine use in this pathology, please. Dr. Boyer. Thank you very much, Leonardo. I will speak about greater trochanteric pain syndrome. As we all know, generally patients in this case complains about a painful point in the area of the posterolateral greater trochanter with a possible spread down to the lateral aspect of the thigh below the knee and to the buttock. Some authors have given us more details. Strauss in 2010 said that pain can appear by palpation, not only spontaneously, and Lustenberger in 2011 mentioned that pain in the lateral aspect of the hip is exacerbated by active abduction, passive abduction, and palpation. Firon pointed out that these uh, symptoms should appear in absence of difficulty in putting on or taking off socks and shoes because we expect these situations in patients with osteoarthritis of the hip. What about epidemiology? Well, this condition has been shown up to 20% of the population and it is common to find it out in women obese patients, and especially at the middle age. Why it is more frequent in women? Well, there are some anatomical and biomechanical reasons. Uh, the insertion of the gluteus minimus is, in general, is smaller in women. The lever arm of the muscles are shorter, and there is some peripheral adiposity and lower femoral tilt angle. There is a long list of pathologies that can give us some pain in the area of the greater trochanter, and we must rule out all of them. The two main differential diagnoses to be considered are hip osteoarthritis and pathology of the lumbar area. Many cases with greater trochanter pain syndrome have pathology in the low back and some authors have even considered that up to 70 percent of these syndromes have a lumbar origin. The Faber test is really useful for detecting trochanter pain syndrome. In this case with the patient in the supine position we ascend with the foot 
on the side to be examined through the contralateral lower limb up to the level of the knee, and then bring the hip to the position of adduction and external rotation fixing the pelvis. The tension on the trochanter will determine pain in positive cases. The overtest is also very useful. It helps us to diagnose a shortening of the iliotibial band. In this case, the patient is placed in lateral decubitus on the normal side. The pelvis is fixed, the hip and knee to be examined are extended, and if the lower limb does not fall on the examination table, it may be showing a shortening of the iliotibial band. But as in many cases of musculoskeletal pathology, the ideal is to perform a combination of tests to have a more accurate diagnosis. Uh, Canderton and collaborators have proposed that the combination of the painful trochanteric palpation, a positive Faber test, pain to resisted abduction and pain to resisted external derotation are a very good option to have an accurate diagnosis. Trochanteric borsitis may be a reason for the pain and this is a patient in which we can see an hyper uptake in the scintigraphy and a clear presence of a borsitis in the MRI. This is another case in which we can see the borsitis but also the presence of loose body inside of the borsa and this is showing that it's a very chronic case. But against of what was accepted many years ago that borsitis was the main reason for this uh, pathological syndrome, uh, we know now that most of the patients do not have any kind of borsitis. And in this paper, uh, it was uh, stated that of a series of almost 900 patients, just 20% had signs of borsitis. We know now more about the biomechanics of the hip and of the abductors muscles of the hip, and there is a new concept that consider them the rotator cuff of the hip. Now we know that in some um, aspects they are very comparable to the rotator cuff of the shoulder. So we know now that most of the cases of pain in the greater trochanter are related with tendinopathies, especially of the gluteus minimus and the gluteus medius. Um, these tendons develop pathologies that are very similar to the ones we know on the rotator cuff of the shoulder, going from a tendinosis, as we can see on the left image, to uh, even tears of these tendons as we see in the image of the right. There is a high rate of abnormalities of these tendons on MRIs in symptomatic patients, but ma we must be aware that there is also a high rate prevalence of uh, anormalities on MRIs in asymptomatic patients. So we must consider this when we are making a diagnosis because we could see a patient with pain with uh, its origin is the lumbar spine and uh, they also have abnormalities on the rotator cuff uh, of the hip muscles. Once we have a correct diagnosis, uh, the education of the patient is very important. There are some postures that should be avoided not to generate overload of the greater trochanter. You can see here in these images, the ones proposed by Grimaldi um, in his paper, and I think this is very useful to educate the patient. Even the position when sleeping uh, can have a very important role in the compression of the area of the trochanter and we can reduce that.
it is also very important to strengthen the gluteus minimus and the gluteus medius to uh, find a balance between them and the muscles that are acting on the fascia lata. The role of injections of corticoid in the area of the borsa is, as you can expect, very limited. On one hand, because as we have seen, uh, most of the patients do not have a borsitis, do not have an inflammation process. And on the other hand, because as we will see, the uh, effect of the corticoids is very limited in time. There is important evidence supporting the use of both radial pressure waves and focus waves in the treatment of this condition. This is a very important paper by uh, Jean de Grompe that compare home training, local corticosteroid injections and radial waves for treating greater trochanter pain syndrome. The authors included more than 200 patients and divide uh, these patients in three groups, one receiving corticosteroids, another radial waves, and uh, the last one, uh, exercise program. The corticosteroids had their best result at one month, but then the effect of the corticosteroid disappeared. The waves had at the fourth month the best results comparing to the other methods. And at 15 months, the exercises gave 80% of good results, whilst radial waves gave 78 of good results. So they are comparable. Another good paper by John Furia, that uh, is a paper in which 66 Patients were included in a retrospective uh, evaluation um, and they compare radial waves versus standard conservative treatment. Their conclusion was that radial waves were safe and effective in the treatment of greater trochanter pain syndrome at the, and that the efficacy is maintained for at least one year. Lustenberger, in a systematic review, stated that radial waves are superior to other conservative options. In our case, as you can see, most of the papers are related to radial waves, but in our case, we have been treating patients with focus waves uh, for many years, 20 years. And 2018, we presented our results in the International Congress of Shockwave uh, Therapy in uh, New Zealand. We included patients with chronic pain in trochanteric region, more than six months of symptoms, a positive Faber test. We also took x-rays and studied the patients by MRIs. We excluded patients with, where the pain was uh, origin in the lumbar area uh, or with hip arthropathy, uh, previous hip surgery, and of course those with shockwave contraindications. We finally got 61 cases, 13 men, 48 women, with an average age of almost 60 years old and an average follow-up of 63 months. We treat them with an electrohydraulic device, applying 2,000 pulses at a level of energy of 0.20 millijoule per square millimeters, uh, three sessions with a two-week interval. The results were that the pain decreased an average of almost three points, the LEFS uh, score improved in an average of 27.3. Both results are statistically significant. Um, the satisfaction level of the patients was 82%. In some cases, we have shown that uh, the calcifications in the area of the trochanter disappear by effect of the focus waves. So the final message is that we must start from a correct diagnosis that not always is easy. Uh, we must correct 
predisposing biomechanical factors and uh, both radial and focus waves are effective for treating gluteal tendinopathy. Thank you very much. Leonardo, you are muted. Now, Karsten is preparing his now, presentation. Thank you, Dr. Yes, thank you, Dr. Moya. Yes, we are going to make some changes because uh, we are going to make the discussion in between us because we don't have the possibility to have questions in the chat because the platform uh, doesn't uh, uh, permit this. So uh, first, I'm going to uh, present Dr. Karsten Nobrock from Germany. Uh, he's is, is uh, our guest special, our, our special guest today. He's going to uh, teach us about a very interesting pathology that we can treat with regenerative medicine, that is the leather hose in the foot. Please, Dr. Nobloch, if you can uh, teach us how to use uh, shockwaves in leather hose pathology. Yeah, Leonardo, dear Daniel, dear family in the end, and dear friends. Um, wait a sec. So uh, actually, lederhose disease of the foot is a, a nodule formation, which might be, but not in every case, be painful. And it is part of a family with well-known dupuytren disease of the hand, with much less known knuckle pads on the PIP joints, as you see here, on the dorsal side of the PRP joints. And same family member is uh, Morbus peroni or Indoratio penis plastica. So a fibromatosis of the dorsal side of the penis. So all these in a way are family members are all fibromatosis. If you do histo histology, you will see the very same. And by chance, yeah, yeah. Carsten, excuse me, we cannot see the full screen. Uh, we see a menu and some. Uh, oh, sorry. but not the. Okay. I will. I will try. I will try again. Good. It's. Is it better? No. We, we, no. 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 Not yet. I go. No. I go out and in. Wait a sec. Please. Perfect. Please. I will try again, there's no problem. So it's better now? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. So just, to get, the, okay. just to get you the ideas, you know, letter hose, dupuytrens, knuckle pads, Peronis disease, all one family. And actually in October, this uh, 15 years ago, my very first patient to where I applied myself, shockwaves on, was a, was a letter hose patient. And uh, Georg Lederhose was a German, I just researched because I didn't know, born in Southern Wiesbaden and went to medical school in Strasbourg, which is in France. And in 1897, he described um, a planta nodule similar to what has Baron Dupuytren has described on the palm of the hand for the foot. And that's why it is called Lederhose disease with a double D. Double delta. Uh, surgery or surgical results are not overwhelming, let's say positive. So there are two uh, bigger studies one with 50, one with some 80 patients, one from Netherlands, one from the US, with recurrence rates in between 60, 60, and 100%. And that's why I started shockwave therapy on these given patients. And I did a cohort study more than 10 years ago, published in 2011. And we found that focused shockwave at that point of time could reduce pain and it's very important. Um, as I, a, a member of a, let's say, self-help group in, uh, in Facebook as well on Lederhose disease, what to expect. So if you have a painful nodule, you can expect by focus shockwave a significant reduction of pain. So we did three treatments with the electromagnetic um, um, device 
and you see six uh, out of, you know, pain scale out of 10, six, six weeks after three, then another six weeks after we did nothing, 1.5. So a significant pain reduction. However, the nodule itself will not, and this is very important to tell patient, it will not disappear because a patient does not want that nodule. And I was hoping romantically 15 years ago that I can just get rid of like a kidney stone. But you know, time and I'm you know learning and ob or observing and 15 years later I'm uh, I'm a bit more clever you will not get rid of the nodule however if there is pain you get something and let's say in the last 10 15 years I tried to see how and what is changing because from time to time I saw a softening an immediate softening of the nodule, sometimes yes, sometimes no. So I then combined focus shockwave, which it did before with radial, however, with very low energies, but with special applicators. And then try to see something in ultrasound and you see maybe a slight change in hypoechogenicity in these early uh, data uh, two, three years ago. And there is a recent study, very nice, from uh, South Korea, published in PLOS One, which is a very, very high level um, paper. They did shockwave therapy, as you see, 0.1 up to 0.15 millijoule, um, up to 12, one, two sessions, you know. And they um, looked on some ultrasound, uh, let's say, characteristics and on pain. And they could show on the one hand and proving what I was seeing 10 years ago that if there is pain in nodules, this pain is in short term and long term significantly reduced. And even roll uh, mostly squa uh, square uh, scores are improved. And they did some ultrasound um, follow-ups before and after, short term, long term and describe, especially in terms of thickness and improvement. However, I'm doing, you know, 20 years of ultrasound and it was, uh, at least with my previous machines, quite hard to, uh, to obtain valid and let's say reproducible data on that. And in November last year, I owned or I presented myself a novel ultrasound, very sophisticated Canon machine. And that's what I can now see with my novel machine. So this is a Lederhose nodule. And you see, this is not only a nodule, but within the nodule, there are, this is an 80, 18 Hertz, so 1.8 megahertz probe. You see structural changes in echogenicity. And the same holds true if you use a very high ultrasound frequency, like a 33 megahertz ultrasound probe, which you can see here. And then you can measure it for sure. However, I then, then started to use a or apply a more sophisticated kind of Doppler mode in, let's say, in relation to the power Doppler, it's called superb microvascular imaging. And in some nodules, I see some marked increase in this, uh, in this vascularization. And what I did, and Kar Karin has told you for plantar fasciitis, and my machine has a shear wave elastography uh, unit within. That's why I bought it in the end. And I just started to obtain or gather some data uh, of how elasticity say stiffness is in that very nodules and how shockwave might interfere. So this is a shear wave elastography in a Lederhose disease. And I now combine focus shockwave high energetic with a special, uh, let's say acupuncture uh, applicator in Lederhose disease, which you see on the right hand side. You see her now in a video. After focus shock wave, I use this T10 acupuncture with some 0.8, one bar with eight Hertz afterwards. And I saw immediately 
an improvement in elasticity measured by shear wave elastography. So by quantitative measure, I see an immediate change in the stiffness of a, a given nodule. So this is ongoing work. And I will present to you in the future, I don't know when, uh, more data because in the end, it is still a rare disease. I see some, sometimes two, three patients in a month, which is for Germany quite much. Um, and so it, it will take some time to give you some more data. So in the moment I'm using still over the past 15 years, high energetic focus shock with this 0.25 or 0.25 three, five millijoule, 2,000 session, uh, 2, shots per session for three times. And I now add radial, shock, uh, radial pressure waves with different applicators in order to even improve elasticity even more. And the idea behind, and there is some reason to believe that Shock waves is not only, as um, Christina pointed out beautifully, is modulating inflammation, is modulating uh, M2 microphage activation, but it's also act, uh, modulating fibrosis. And by interaction with TGF beta, which is a driving force in fibrosis, it appears that focus shock wave, and as of now, I'm not that sure how much radio pressure waves add in this regard. However, for sure, shock, focus shock wave can modulate the expression of TGF better and therefore modulate a cascade which is leading to fibrosis. So in a way, put it simply, if you have less TGF better, you have less fibrosis. And that's why we see some antifibrotic effects in dupuytrens in later Hose disease, that's what urologists are reporting in Peroni's disease, what we can see. So pain reduction and a reduction, but not a resolution of the nodules in Peroni's. And the same holds true for scars. That's the very same mechanism. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Karsten, for your presentation. Very interesting presentation. Yes, applause for him. Now we have a, a very short discussion. Please open all your microphones because raising your hand, you can do questions in between us. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, Karen has the, a question that has, yes. Uh, please Karen, do the question uh, that you have. For, Thank for you, all person. my friends, for the great presentations. Um, Karsten, I have a little host disease. You can experiment with me. I am yes. your next patient. I will come <laughs> to Madrid, so we do. A question for Christina. Christina, have you seen that bone marrow edema um, around the calcaneus is also a good predictive factor for your shockwave therapy in Achilles tendinopathy? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Many congratulations to all of you. Very excellent lectures. Thank you. Um, thank you, Karen, for your questions. In my clinical experience, uh, as uh, in the literature, I didn't find until now a paper uh, f uh, with the answer of your question. In my, in my clinical experience, uh, is uh, not so good to have uh, uh, Achilles and you know, enthesiopathy with bone marrow edema. The problem is that from the clinical point of view, uh, in most of the cases, uh, bone marrow edema, uh, typically at, uh, at the enthesis of Achilles, is uh, um, uh, recognized very late uh, in the clinical course of the patient, uh, usually when you, have, when you have a persistent pain. And so you have to check the presence, uh, but you know that MRI is not the first level of in, uh, in, uh, in the imaging, um, but uh, uh, only uh, later on. Uh, bone marrow edema can be uh, due to overuse in athletes, in running and so on, but in most of the cases is related to a metabolic disease and aromatic disease. And you, surely this is not a good predictor factor. So it's, it's a very mm -hmm. complex topic. 
The problem is to early diagnose and early to recognize this, uh, the disease and uh, always uh, when you have bone marrow edema in the antesis of the Achilles, always thinking, but not only Achilles, uh, also patellar and plantar fasciitis, only think, or always uh, think to a possible general systemic disease of our patient. You know that in our hospital, we are um, <clears throat> doing showways since many decades. So we received many, many, many bad cases. Uh, we are not new patients. Uh, all Typically the patient uh, is uh, moving from one center to another one and so on. It comes from me uh, to me um, after many years of Achilles pain. So it's very hard. But uh, from a general point of view is not a good predictor from the clinical. And you have to consider also that sometimes the patient comes uh, from, for, for show waves uh, and then goes to the surgery and come back again to show weight after uh, surgical intervention, for uh, example, for um, Aglund's disease uh, with periostitis. And the problem is that if you do not consider at the moment of surgery that you have bone marrow edema and you do not treat and have a, a full recovery of bone marrow edema and dentesis, is this is not a good predictor of the results and the, the patients come back again in, in your office. So it's a very, very hot topic, but very, very interesting to speculate and to research. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Christina. Thank you, Christina. Yes, uh, we can continue. I know that uh, Dr. Teran has some questions also for, uh, please, Dr. Teran. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I have a, a one question for, for all. Uh, in tendinopathies that show small tears, with small tears, what would be your um, protocol for treatment? Hertz, PRP, or shock waves? You, uh, I don't know, Kasten, maybe. Question? <laughs> Dr. Kasten? Yeah. So for me, for me, you know, I'm treating nearly every tendon all over hand, finger tendons, shoulder tendons. So in my personal view, the best way to stimulate uh, tendon health is shockwaves, you know? And it appears in the moment that other techniques like the novel electromagnetic field therapy done with Ludgar in the huge trial on the shoulders, we see even a doubling of the efficacy combining shock waves and the EMTT for shoulder tendons. So in the moment, being non-invasive, this is the best in my view. And then I would more opt on, in the moment, more opt on hyaluronic acid. But, you know, PRP is evolving and I have a number of friends and Daniel and uh, in the US as well, there are uh, overwhelming people using different types of PRP with leukocyte rich, leukocyte uh, poor, sure. whatever things. So, but in my view, shock waves is superior. Yeah. Okay. Is, is somebody that have, <laughs> yes, Leonardo, is somebody that have yeah. another, another uh, opinion about this? Yeah. Yes, I, I have another opinion. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, I think, no, no, I, I just want to say, for me, the best option for shoulder tendons uh, is not shock waves. Uh, the best option is uh, to regulate the loading of the tendons with exercises. Sure. Uh, and sure. of course, then you can use other techniques. Uh, we must uh, put clear that, for instance, for for the American shoulder, uh, for American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, uh, there is they consider that it's a very limited evidence supporting the use of uh, PRP or the use of hyaluronic acid. So uh, I I feel that shock waves are a good option for calcific tendinopathies, but I must say that most of my patients have shoulder tendinopathies, 
And most of them had a great result just with a very organized uh, program of exercises. And I don't need more. I, I don't uh, need the patients to pay for uh, another option uh, or the system to pay for other option because it has been demonstrated that a program exercises, I prefer the base, a, base, a home based program exercises, is very efficient. So, and generally, I do not need to uh, use in a non calcific tendinopathy other options. Okay. I want to say something to Paul that what we are doing now in Spain, after more than 15 years of experience with PRP, the group of Anitua, the group of Barcelona, uh, Dr. Um, uh, we are characterizing now PRP. We are giving now a code to the PRP. And this is a code with numbers, with six numbers. The account of platelet of each patient, the account of platelet in your concentration of PRP, the account of leucocytes of hematias, if it is activated, not activated. So up to now, we will be able to compare in future with the same uh, preparations the exit of the of our patients. Otherwise, this this is impossible because everyone is preparing different forms of PRP. In in honor of time, uh, I will give the the, uh, the answer to to Christina that is raising their hand. But please, short answers, because if not, we, are, we can't discuss everything that we would like to, to know in this moment. Yeah. Christina, please. Yeah, yeah, sorry, very, very short. I can say that my point of view that I agree with Kasten, with uh, Daniel, Karin. <laughs> the problem is that probably as something brought in the literature that not all the tendons are the same tendons. Yeah. One part, we have Achilles and patellar, and uh, another thing are... Uh, shoulder and elbow. And the problem is that uh, you cannot treat tendon with one therapy. According to the stage and uh, the evolution of the disease and the anatomical district, you can, uh, you, you have to choose uh, some different strategies. In our experience in Italy nowadays, uh, and uh, I invite you to read that very, very nice uh, review of Professor Mafuli about the innate immunity a great interest is toward monocytes. As monocytes related to macrophages, you know that macrophages are my, <laughs> my, my fixed topic, but uh, macrophages are able to regulate the turnover of the tendon uh, are responsible uh, in the um, beginning and evolving uh, and uh, the evolution of tendinopathies. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I agree with, with Karsten that uh, in every uh, uh, district of the tendons of our body, uh, with the show waves, uh, we can modulate uh, that uh, chronic low grade inflammation that is uh, probably is uh, responsible for the failed healing response. Uh, of the tendon is if we accept the so-called immunocentric revolution in the pathogenesis of tendinopathy, but is a work in progress. Right. Okay. Thank okay. you. Some, thank you very much. Somebody of of the of the speakers use combined technologies to to uh, treat uh, to treat tendons. For example, eccentric exercise with shock waves. Or for example, la laser therapy, high intensity laser therapy uh, with shock waves. Uh, I, we, very short, please only say yes or no, because if not, the time will not permit yes. us to continue. <laughs> yes, Carson, yes, you, you, yes. Carson, yes, yes, yes. Raise your, you raise your hand. Yes, yes. Yeah. Which, which technology you prefer and in which tendon? Please, uh, um, Christina. Shockwave and rehabilitation. Okay. Uh, Shockwave and rehabilitation too. And Karsten. Same thing. So I did some 15, 20 studies on eccentric training or Achilles. So eccentrics and shockwaves 
and then is coming EMTT and then lower low level laser because you need five low level laser sessions for one shockwave session in efficacy. Okay, and Dr. Moya. Yes, well, it's up. I, I agree that we can use different tools according to the tendon and to the stage of the generation of the tendon. So, but generally, rehab is my first choice. And the second choice would be rehab and shock waves. And the third choice, surgery. Uh, you know, there are some diseases in which the only option is surgery. Of course, yeah. if you have a rotator cuff tear, a complete tear of the rotator cuff. So, those would be both my choices now. Okay, Dr. Teran. Um, Which, basically, oh. I use a uh, high intensity laser, um, shock waves, and uh, eccentric ex exercise. That's my product. Mm -hmm. and, and the last question for everybody. You think, because there are a very, very interesting publications uh, about this nowadays, done by Daniel, also by Paul. Uh, we have complications with shock wave technologies or is a completely non-risk technologies? Dr. Moya. Well, that, that's a good question. We divided the complication, the bad results and complications in three different groups. Complications related to an um, inaccurate diagnosis. And I could say that that is the most common reason for bad results. Uh, the, because the problem is that having a device does not make us experts in all pathologies. So we must be aware of that. Second, there are technical errors, and those are common related to the way the, the shockwaves are applied. Generally, if it is a good quality device, we do not have problems with the devices. And the third point are complications that are unexpected bad results, but there is no guilty in the operator or in the device. Those are natural evolution of things, you know? So a pneumothorax, if you are treating a, a trigger point, is not a complication. It is a bad technical application. Uh, so we must be very clear on that. Yeah. Okay, okay, Christina. Yes, I agree, perfectly agree with Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. The important thing is that you have to follow the good clinical practice rules and you have to, uh, to document very well before you begin the treatment. And you know that you can have a spontaneous rupture, subcutaneous rupture of the tendon, uh, Achilles, uh, first of all, but mm -hmm. you can have the lesion right before the treatment if you have uh, not documented uh, somebody could 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 say that so it's also a medical legal problem okay and dr teran i have read a, a publication about patella tendon and some complications complications in uh, your experience what happened yeah, with your we, patients we we have seen uh, many case of uh, little raptors or raptors, partial raptors of a uh, patellar tendon with a bad application with shock waves. There are publicated in, in some uh, reviews, but um, the, the first cause is a, a bad technique for application of the shock waves. That's the, the first cause in, in all of the complications uh, I can see in the patellar tendon. I would okay. I would suggest that maybe even the because I'm doing you know ultrasound on every on every patient on every yeah. meeting, and if a diameter in a in the AP diameter in a patella tendon is larger say than eight millimeters, and I saw some football profiles with some twelve or thirteen AP millimeters diameter. There is the risk of spontaneous ruptures because the tendon is that much degenerated that it will by itself rupture, you know, in the moment he will disappear from exam room, regardless of what I do, you know, mm -hmm. therefore it is quite important. That's what I do. And I would suggest to ultrasound and I, in every invoice for every patient for every day, there is a diameter, the AP diameter of the tendon and even the degree of neovascularization. So everybody can see, and even the insurance system can see 
how diameter was in that very moment I did this scan. And the larger the scan diameter in a patella, in Achilles, the more likely after a threshold is a spontaneous rupture. And I would suggest if there is no injection done, because usually there is someone who did some traumail where was some corticoid within, but if there's really native virgin knee patella, I would suggest that in the moment you have seven or eight or more di millimeters diameter, there is the risk of spontaneous ruptures, not because of the technique, but because of the disease. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think that, I think that uh, 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 we have to make a little summary because it's enough for uh, this uh, teaching today. Thank you for everybody. But the summary is for everybody that's, that is uh, starting this. First, to, to treat these pathologies in the lower extremity, you have to have a perfect diagnosis. Second, you have to have good methods to the diagnosis. You have to know how to use echography, how to use MRI, and you have to know the essence of the pathology. This is not an inflammatory pathology only, it has a degenerative pathology in combination, the also, the also important thing is to know how to use the devices and what device you have. And you have to make courses, uh, practice courses, not only online courses, to know how to do it. This is a presence technology. You have to be with the patients to know how they are, the other reactions. Uh, the other th important thing that these technologies are two types, pressure, shock waves, or radial shock waves and focus. We have to, there are different technologies, but we can apply this in the different pathologies. In lower extremity, and the difference of upper extremity, both technologies have have been uh, have given us a good result in the papers, and we have to continue doing especially good papers to demonstrate that this non-invasive regenerative medicine is very useful and we have to uh, continue doing it because in the new medicine, it's better to be non-aggressive doctors first and after apply our surgery or whatever we need to have success with the pain of the patient. Uh, again, I will uh, give a uh, thank you very much to everybody of you and uh, also to AutoWave TV that uh, make us possible with this platform to uh, uh, hear such, a, such a great experts of all the worlds that are also good friends. And uh, in this non-invasive regenerative medicine, we are friends all over the world. And we, I, I hope we continue working for this very interesting issue in medicine. Thank you very much to everybody. And I, I hope to see you in the next opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you very, very much, much Leonardo. Bye-bye. See, bye. see, bye. bye. see you everybody in Madrid. Yes, bye. Yes. But <laughs> but I already booked it. Before, yes. before him. Before, before. In November, we will in have November, a yes, yes, in Vienna, yes, Austria. Yes. And most yes. likely... Sure. Despite sure. everything, it will be yes, sure. a more, you know, a the first chance to get real life interaction. And we are planning real life interaction as a conference. So beginning of November, traveling to Vienna, sure. this mo most sure. likely will be the first stop for us all. Yeah, absolutely, sure. absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And we will meet uh, next August. Uh, in a webinar like this one, but discussing bone pathology. Uh, Wolfgang yes. Schaden, who will be the president of the Congress in Vienna in November, and he will give right. us details next month. On August 28th, uh, we will meet here for bone pathologies. Perfect. Yes. 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 Perfect. Yes. We will be here. Thank Good. you very much bye to bye everyone. Bye. Thank you very bye much. Bye. 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 Adios. Bye-bye, my friends. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, friends. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>